So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a few questions up here, uh, what I call the, the fire side chat, Steve, if that works Where's for you. Where's the fire? Huh? It's missing an action, and apparently two other people are going to be joining us shortly as well. Uh, but until then, we're going to do some questions up here, and then, guys, we're going to have you guys open it up to questions out here on the floor. Great. So you talk a lot about the rise of, of the rest. For, for you, what's an inherently special, or what's the opportunity when you think about a Des Moines, a Kansas City, and uh, an Omaha when it comes to entrepreneurial endeavors? Well, as I was saying, I think the, the key is you gotta have a good idea. Those ideas can come from any place, but actually often the best ideas come from people that are a little outside of the, of the conventional wisdom and looking at things in a different kind of context. AOL actually was not started in Silicon Valley. It was started in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. We looked at this internet and the idea of the internet and basically said we need to figure out a way to make it simpler and more affordable and so forth. People in other places thought that, like in Silicon Valley, had a sense that people understood technology there and a lot of them were engineers, so the services that existed at the time, CompuServe and Source and things like that, seemed like they were fine. You know, we thought they were hard. Some people who were more you know, comfortable with technology thought they were, they were easy. So having a context that's a little bit different and looking at challenges and opportunities in a little different way and say, what about this or what about that? Those ideas can happen anywhere, but actually often happen when, out, when you're outside of sort of the, you know, the, the conventional wisdom. So you have to start with the idea. Then you have to have the talent. And so ultimately it's how can you, any company is only as good as its people. So how can you recruit initially just a handful to get something going? And now the nice thing is it's much easier to start a company uh, with fewer employees than it might have been 10 or 20 years ago because you are able to, to outsource a lot of different things, to, particularly on the website, to, to Amazon Web Services or, or things like that. So before, in order to start a company, you had to kind of do everything. Now you can do one thing in a, in a much more narrow way. So to one, two, three people. Uh, you know, can really kind of uh, Instagram, which is I'm sure some of you know, is a very successful, I don't know how many uh, users they now have, a couple hundred million probably, uh, maybe more, uh, sold to Facebook for nearly a billion dollars. When it, when it sold, it had 12 employees. 12 employees. You know, 20 years ago, you probably need 1,200 employees to you know, build up that kind of company and, and scale to that kind of uh, uh, degree. So you need talent, and how do you attract uh, the talent? Uh, and some of that is looking what you already have. Some of that is recruiting people, uh, including some who may have grown up here and then went away because they thought they couldn't stay here and do the things they want to do here, but now there's a reason to, to come back. And the last piece is, is capital. So how do you make sure that your idea gets the opportunity to have a and stay in the sun, uh, and venture capital in most of the regions outside of the core has been difficult, uh, but two things are happening that I think are reason to be optimistic. One is, as I mentioned, crowdfunding, which will go into place. The law passed six months ago. The SEC's work on the regulation now will go in place early next year, which will enable companies to basically say, here's, here's my idea. Do you want to invest in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, idea? Uh, and the second is, as we start seeing some of these companies grow in regions that are off the beaten track, you'll start seeing more venture capitalists that are in California or New York or other places starting to look in those regions and, and try to find the, the companies that really have the, you know, the breakout potential. You also mentioned earlier during your talk the importance of, of supporting entrepreneurs and supporting entrepreneurial communities. Right. What, what is the best way to go about that? Is, is it beyond incubators? Is, is it the crown fund for crowdfunding? Is it, is it policy efforts, mm -hmm. which I know you work really closely on in, mm -hmm. in Washington? Well, I think at a community level, it's really trying to understand what's unique about each community and what, uh, how do you build on the, the strengths that are there uh, and how do you connect the dots. In almost every community, there are interesting people doing interesting things, but they're not usually connected in a networked way as, as, as seamlessly as they should be. So they therefore you don't get the kind of leverage. So trying to, and that's the key part of the Startup America and, and some of the success with Startup Iowa is just around that. How do you create the, the, the momentum, what Jeff's trying to do with Silicon Prairie and, and conferences like this, getting people together, talk about these issues, actually is really important you know, a piece of that. If everybody's kind of doing their own thing, kind of in their own silo in a kind of disconnected way, you don't really get that sense of possibility and that, uh, uh, that sense of momentum. So at the community level, that's, that's uh, really important. At the DC policy uh, level, uh, it is trying to make sure we can build uh, bipartisan support for pro-entrepreneurship legislation. And as I, as I said before, it's tough. And, and you, you folks understand that's how partisan things have become. But thankfully, on this issue of uh, the, the Startup Act, uh, the Jumpstarting Our Business Startups Act, 
uh, which did legalize crowdfunding, it was it passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. The President Obama came out in support of it. Eric Cantor, the majority leader, came out in support of it. And, and, and the vast majority of Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate voted in favor of it. And I was delighted to actually be at the Rose Garden when the President signed it, standing next to Eric Cantor. Because Eric Cantor and Barack Obama don't seem to get along very well and don't seem to see eye to eye on many issues. But on the issue of entrepreneurship, they did. So the question is, how do you build on that and, and get attention, particularly on this issue of, of high-skilled immigration, which, just to touch on it, I know immigration is like a really complicated issue, emotional issue, controversial issue, you know, really complicated. The issue of high-skilled immigration, engineers and entrepreneurs, needs attention urgently. Right now, if you go to our great research universities, MIT or Carnegie Mellon or you, you name them, about half of the people come in to get you know, PhDs, masters, or from other countries. We give them these great educations, and for the most part, we kick them out, force them to go home to start companies there that compete with companies here, which is insane. And so the idea of stapling a green card to those diplomas and not only make it easier for them to stay here, but ask them to stay here. And so they basically say, yeah, we, we, we've invested in you by giving you this great education, we need you to in your, in a, kind of in a way serve and, 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 and contribute or be starting a company or joining a company. Now this is an issue that has bipartisan support. President Obama and Mitt Romney have both come out in favor of this idea. And what happens though is it gets caught up in this broader debate around comprehensive immigration reform, which needs to happen. But while we work, wait for that bigger problem to get solved, we're still kicking out you know, thousands of these people every month that could be starting the next companies. And 40% of Fortune 500 companies are started by first or second generation immigrants. Like Google, you know, like a pretty big company. You know, <laughs> kind of important that folks like that, when they were at Stanford, were able to stay uh, and, and didn't go, and, and, and go somewhere else. Let's change gears a little bit for the entrepreneurs in our audience. Well, with your company, you've invested in companies like Zipcar, Living Social, Exclusive Resorts, et cetera. Right. Um, what are some of the consistent threads in the companies that you choose to invest in? Well, we are, we, we are a little bit different than, than uh, some uh, investors because we, we tend to do a relatively small number of things and then spend more time on them. There are some investors who like to do a lot of things and have more of a portfolio thing. We're, we're a little bit more, quite, quite a bit more Selective, so we'll make a handful of investments each year, not not uh, not dozens. So therefore, you know, we really need to believe in the entrepreneur and believe in the idea, and particularly believe that the entrepreneur is trying to create a change the world company with a longer term, built to last orientation. There are actually a lot of entrepreneurs that are in for kind of the quick flip, kind of a. You know, they're building companies with the explicit idea of selling them to Google or somebody two years later. That's fine, and you know, that creates innovation, creates jobs, creates you know, economic growth, that's fine. But we're much more interested in not the built to flip companies, but the built to last companies. What are the problems that might take 10 or 20 years to, to solve, uh, like education? And you know, who are the entrepreneurs that really have the passion and the perseverance to, to fight that battle over a long, you know, period of time through a lot of, you know, ups and downs. So we have a bias that is more in, 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 in that direction. You mentioned healthcare and education, two big areas, but are there any other areas that are ripe for disruption, in your opinion? Yeah, right there, 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 there are many areas because uh, the nature of what's happened with, 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 uh, with technology. I'll give you a couple examples of things we've done recently. One in education, a company called Echo360 is working with 600 universities to try to usher in an era of blended learning or flipped classrooms. How do you capture lectures and allow people to watch them maybe in the dorm and then when they're in their classroom have more of a, of a discussion. Uh, that kind of thing I think is, uh, is important. Made a couple investments in, in healthcare. One's going to be called Everyday Health. There's about 40 million people using its various uh, you know, sites and apps and so forth. And more recently, a company called RunKeeper in the mobile space. They have a, an app that tracks you know, running and, and jogging and, and different, different kinds of things, but also created something called the Health Graph. Uh, that kind of like Facebook has a social graph, they're creating a health graph so all kinds of different devices can, uh, can, uh, can plug into it. 
Uh, we also invested about a year ago in a company called Gramercy One. Uh, it's kind of like open table for everything other than restaurants, allowing real-time booking of spa appointments or you know, pet appointments, things like that, where there's, there's real-time uh, inventory uh, issues. So there's a variety of different things that, uh, you know, that interest us. But as I said, the bias is more on the, the things that you know, kind of take a little while to really be, be, be significant. Okay. Another question for you. For you guys right now, if you have a question, please start lining up with the microphones. Uh, for Steve to start lining up right now. Um, we have a lot of young entrepreneurs in this audience, and you, know, you think back to when you first started AOL um, and how that grew. What are areas as, as a young entrepreneur that you wish you would have uh, focused on more, and are there some areas you wish you would have focused on less early on? Well, I think the most important thing, as I said before, is the people side. And how do you how do you get make sure you're really careful in the in the in the people that bring you come into that founding team, and then as it scales. Uh, how do you make sure you preserve as much of that uh, culture of, of being real pioneers as, as possible? Uh, in our case, we actually, as I said, had the luxury of it going relatively slowly before it went really fast. As I mentioned, when public, we had um, a couple hundred thousand uh, customers. We also had only about 200 employees. Uh, so from the founding to seven years later, it went from we started with 25, 30 people. Seven years later, it was I think a little under 200 people. Seven years after that it was seven or 8,000 people. So we had the luxury of building sort of that core team and that culture, and then when things really accelerated, it did get hard to kind of keep that same kind of passion as we were adding, you know, basically, you know, a lot of people uh, really, uh, really quickly. And we did make some mistakes there in terms of not really being able to, you know, attract the people that didn't just have the right resume, but really could fit in terms of the, you know, the culture and the passion around the, you know, the service that we're providing. So I'd say the, you know, the place to focus mostly is on people. Second fo place to focus on product. Ultimately, product matters. And, and you know, the, the, the success, the enormous success of, of, of Apple when the Steve Jobs came back into the company was basically built on that product and, and, the, and the simple, compelling uh, vision of, 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 of that product. So I'd say people, number one, product. And then product, not just in a technology sense. The product could be what you're serving in, in a restaurant or some other uh, service you're, you're trying to provide, really nailing it and having something that is demonstrably better than what anybody else is doing and not settling for just having it being okay. It's gotta be great. Okay, let's open up for the audience. Let's start right over here, please. <laughs> 